Good morning, Gallatin Church. Hey, it is great to see everybody out there this morning. I'm Steve. And I'm Angie. And we're here to talk about our favorite subject, which is not ice cream, unfortunately, or cake or cookies. But we're here to talk to you today again about sharing. sharing. That's right. Just wanted to take a moment just to thank you for sharing our live stream on Facebook. Um, love those watch parties. We're seeing great results and um, a lot of positive feedback with that. And Steve's here to tell you how to do that. That's right, because I am the resident tech genius. Yeah. And so modest. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's just the way I am, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, what we're going to ask you to do is pull out your phones. That's right. Yes. You're in church and we're asking you to pull out your phone and get on Facebook. Probably won't happen very often. So go to the Gallatin page, find the live stream, scroll down to the bottom and you'll see the share button mm -hmm. and just click that share button. You can make a comment. You can tag a friend if you'd like, or you can just leave it blank. Now, in a couple weeks, we're going to kick this thing into high gear and we can't wait to share that with you all <laughs> here pretty shortly. So it's great to see you guys today. Always love worshiping with you all. And that's what I'm getting ready to do. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon. your glory. Worship team for leading us in song. 
Oof, I said it this morning in Goodlesville. I know we've been back longer, but how true is that opening line of that song? We've waited for this day and we're gathered in your name. And we know that we don't um, invite um, the presence of God into this place. We simply acknowledge that it is here with us. Yeah, you can be seated. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Hey, there was a great turnout in Goodlesville this morning. Again, people were being safe and socially distancing, wearing PPE and um, hand, hand washing, sanitizing, and we know that we're still being very careful. Uh, if you do have children in the service today, there's a family restroom that has been cleaned uh, right back there uh, behind the welcome desk. And of course, you can still utilize the uh, two restrooms in the corner at any time. We have been diligently cleaning. Thank you to the deacons and those who showed up early uh, today and yesterday also to make sure that we were ready to go in worship today. We are here, we are together, we are gathered whether in this place or online. Thank you if you are tuning in online, and thank you to our tech team on both campuses who is putting um, these services together. We know that many people are still, again, staying home, and some people are sick. Um, the word tells us that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I, the Lord God, will hear from heaven and heal their land. We want to make that our, our prayer today, so join me now as we open with that word. Dear Lord, we do humbly come before you. God, we bow uh, our knees, our collective knees, to your will. We bow, God, in submission to your uh, word, to your truth, and to the way, God, presented in the gospel by Jesus Christ. So, God, today we pray that whatever we sing, whatever we say, would point toward that truth, that this um, service would be a, a pleasing aroma to you, God, that we would be um, conformed more to the image of Christ. And we would leave here knowing, discerning God's will, your will, Father, for our life and acting upon it. Be with this worship team now as they continue to lead us in song. We ask again all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll be reading from Second Peter chapter 1, 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received the honor, the glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Thank you for the authority of your word. I ask that you um, be with us this morning, prepare our hearts and our minds, um, Lord, to receive the message. Um, God, I just thank you for the ability to be here, whether we're here in person or online. Help us to hear the word today and to apply it to our lives the rest of the week. We're about to sing a song about the goodness of God. I told Goodlettsville this, but um, I had a conversation with somebody regarding this song a while back, and um, he said, I don't know, because what what about when God isn't good? And I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure God is good all the time. Um, but it did make me think about how sometimes we can see we don't know what goodness really is. We think goodness is whatever pleases us, whatever um, entices us initially. Um, it's something that makes us feel good, but I think God gives us a different look at what goodness really is. Goodness is love in action. It's, it's something that may not feel fluffy and, and pretty, um, but it'll serve our eternities the best. Um, so I just think about whatever is going on in the world, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, however crazy it gets, um, how many, if everything falls apart, if all our plans just don't work out, um, 
we can get in this mindset of, oh my goodness, Lord, it's crazy. Is there anything that's good? Let us draw back to the gospel. Let's remind ourselves of that. And as we sing these songs, let's let's think about what the gospel is, that, that God sent his one and only son, fully man, fully God, to experience the temptations of man, to experience the worries, the, the anger, the emotion that we go through. <laughs> God sent his son who was mocked by us, by people like us, by um, we spat on him. We, we yelled, crucify him, crucify him. We tortured him, and we hung him on a cross. And on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is the good news, that we, as broken people, as chaotic souls, um, we get to experience eternity with the Father. We get salvation and forgiveness and mercy. That, that's good. That's a good God, and he is good all the time. Um, when we get to heaven, I don't know what's going to be there, but I know that Jesus is going to be there, and that will be worth it all just to see, just to see Jesus' face, <laughs> just to embrace him and walk with him and sit with him. That is, that is better than anything that I can imagine. It's better than any riches, any, any nice clothing. That is, that's the goal. That's heaven is to, to be in the very presence of God. So as we continue to worship, may we reflect on that truth died for us. He loves us where we are. In Romans, it tells us that even in the midst of our sin, Christ died for us. So let's remember that this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in
challenge and encourage you this time. Um, I know the CDC has come with uh, information about how singing might in fact be one of the more dangerous things we can do. And I know that that was a new song uh, that we've introduced recently. I hope that that uh, truth resonates with you today, that he has been faithful and he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it in you. I love that song and I love this next song too, but I, I'd like to call you to, to be seated again. And we, we want to use this song again, not as an invitation for God to indwell. We know that we're two or more gathered. He is already there. Not that he would come into this place because he already is. We, would, we want to use this next song as you would sit quietly and pray, as you would reflect as the worship team leads this song that I know we all know. If you're watching online, we ask that you would pause, that you would pray, and hear again that you would prepare your heart today to hear from God's word as the worship team sings this song. There's nothing worth more that'll ever come close. No thing can compare your Sweetest of loves, when my heart becomes free. 
tablet or if you're watching at home pull up a new tab on your computer or open your physical bible i know many of you still bring those and that is awesome to the book of second peter and the second chapter second peter chapter two second peter chapter two Uh, as you just saw in that short sermon um, buffer video, today's message is entitled, A Warning Against Heresy. Hannah Mills preached last week from 2 Peter chapter 1, and did she not do a fantastic job? Amen. Yes. Thank you, Ted. Ted was listening. No one else was listening. Come on, guy. I'm just kidding. Everyone was here. Everyone was listening. Great attendance last week, both online and in person. And also really great to be back in church today in the Goodlettsville Church and now here in Gallatin. But she challenged several things from um, 2 Peter chapter 1. She reminded us that we can be assured of our faith, that we can have that blessed assurance that I know I grew up singing about and many of you did as well. That we can be building up our faith. I really love the picture that Hannah Mills used of a, a salvation being like a yard, this beautiful, lush, green yard that we have. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's an awesome promise of salvation that we would have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but that we can also enrich our yard by building up a garden. I love that enrich idea, that these are supplements. These are things we can add, and when my wife adds these seeds to the ground, I eat the tomatoes. That's how the garden works at our house. I built the box, okay? I built the box, all right? And I throw the rocks at the deer to keep them away. We know that we can enrich our lives as Christians by having these attributes. Again, these are not things that we add to our faith because Jesus plus anything is heresy. We know that salvation plus baptism or as Paul and um, as the writers of the New Testament preached against, um, they were saying, well, you accepted Jesus in salvation. Now you have to be circumcised. Whoa, pump the brakes. That doesn't say that, right? We see several times that there are heresies are, uh, arising that... Paul speaks out against, that Peter speaks out against, and if we have any, um, anything to be reminded of today or anything um, to rest in, we should rest in the fact that this message today is applicable because it was applicable in AD 65 when Peter wrote it, and there were already among them false teachers and false teachings. False teachers and false teachings. And Hannah's um, sermon was titled, A Hero's Welcome. And because I'm a recovering Southern Baptist, I really wanted to make this um, sermon title, like, line up with that and use the HW. I wanted to call it a heretical warning, but it's not the warning that's heretical, it's the teaching. So this is a warning against heresy. I did my best to use my gift of alliteration, but it just didn't happen this week. I'm sorry, Ted. I'll do better, man. I'll do better. Building up our faith, enriching our lives now, this list that we add to, that we might add uh, goodness, that we might add all these attributes can really be compared to the same list or similar list that Paul gives in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, not the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruit, that these are what the outward signs to other people. If you love, if you are patient, if you have peace abiding in your heart, if that you are what saved, that you are one of the sheep. Speaking of sheep, uh, that gets me to the big point. Anytime I, I plan a message, Tim says I should be able to do the big point in five words or less. Dwight, I did even better this week. I got it down to three words, okay? This is theologically deep stuff. I hope you're writing in your notes already. We're going to say it together. I'm going to say it first, and then I'm going to get you to say it with me like sheep, okay? Three words. You ready? This is a big takeaway. Heresy is bad. That's it, all right? There's your tweetable, Dwight. I'm just kidding. I got tweetables later. Don't tweet that one yet, all right? Now, everybody say it with me. In the third word, say it like you're a sheep. Ready, Autumn? Heresy is... Y'all did good. That was good. 
It's bad. Heresy is bad. I thought I saw a, a meme this week online, Jim, and it said, um, "It's interesting that Christians would use sheep as an insult. Also interesting that Christians are hurling insults." <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> True statement. We are referred to in the Bible many times as sheep. Of course, uh, Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd. Tim and I are referred to as those who, as pastors, shepherd a flock. And we're going to look at that imagery again later. We need to remind ourselves of these things by being in the word. As Hannah said last week, Peter's going to tell us in chapter 3 that the number one way that we can know and stand up to false teachings and false teachers is by knowing what God's word says. So my exact last point today is going to be the same as Hannah's was last week. Be in the word. If you're close to the sun, you will shine. If you are close to the vine, you will bear. Good job, John 15, 5. You will bear fruit. And again, today's message, building upon and expounding upon um, 2 Peter chapter 1. I would really encourage you, if you have not already seen the midweek Bible study, Journey Through Scripture, I had a really great time doing that with Angela Mills and Hannah Mills. Of course, Hannah preaching, recapping some of her points, and then Angela Mills and I unpacking with her um, 2 Peter chapter 3. And we did that out of order for a reason, because First Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1 it gives an encouragement and a reminder and of what to do, be in the word. Chapter 3 gives a, oh, don't forget, these things stand up for what is righteous, live godly lives, and reminds us again to be in God's word. So one and three are really similar, but two is this giant aside. I would call it an angry tangent that Peter goes off on against two things, false teachings and false teachers. And today I'm going to continue to refer to those false teachings as heresy. Everybody say that word with me. Heresy. Heresy is a doctrinal belief, a, an undoctrinal belief, an unorthodox belief that might have a grain of truth to it but has been distorted from God's word. Heresy goes against the systematic theology of Scripture. I'm also going to talk about that a lot today. Systematic theology. The system being what the read that we hold it to. As, Ange, uh, excuse me, as Angie read earlier, Cook, not Angela Mills, as Angie Cook read earlier, this is what has been given to us. We can attest that the prophets are true, that the history given to us in the Bible is factual. We know from the canon of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, that these are the things that have been revealed. That there is no power by man to which we can have a revelation. There is no power by man that which we can stand in this pulpit. I have a friend across town today who's probably starting his sermon with something like, God has given me a message for the people of the, of the Lord. Ooh, cringe. Slight cringe. Um, he's a great dude. Super powerful speaker. But I pray that he would come back to the fold of not preaching his own power, but the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Well, there's lots of ways that this message could um, be presented. And today, I don't want to just make a list of all the false teachers that are on the New York, best, uh, New York Times bestselling list or that are filling the Astrodome, all right? You're welcome. All right, listen. Thanks, Jim. Listen, th there's going to be some obvious ones that I'm going to point out, okay? And there's going to be some that you will infer from the teaching today. Remember, the overarching theme and the idea here today is that we would be able to notice what is heretical, that we would be able to call out heresy when we see it, and that we would be able to stand up against it by putting out truth in our lives, our actions, our attitudes, the attributes that we, that we attest to have in the fruit and by the power of the Spirit. Again, the big point is this, heresy is bad. But if you do want a list of heretics, I recommend a rap song by a guy named Shy Lin. He is a... Um, he is a, a reformed theology rapper, reformed rapper. That's the R squared label. I'm just kidding. That doesn't exist, but it should. It should. I think they'd have one artist and it would be him. Briley introduced me to this song a few years ago, and I finally remember now that this was the song that quotes, I believe, John MacArthur in saying, if you're having your best life now, you're probably not going to heaven. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, that there would be false teachers and that we could recognize them. I'm going to quote it again later, but I want you to jot this one down in your margins too. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus tells us there will be false teachers and that we, the sheep, can recognize the wolves. And in um, 21 through 23, these are the people that he is talking about, that bone-chilling bone chilling truth that Jesus tells us. 
Many will stand before me on that day and say, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not perform miracles? And what my version says, he will cast them away, away from me, depart from me, you workers of iniquity or you evil doers. Oh, it's chilling. That is the truth of God from the mouth of the son. Well, Daniel, we really, I don't know if we should be doing this. Let me go ahead and just say that um, we should be doing this. We should be pointing out heresy. We should be pointing out false teachings because we're going to look at today several reasons why. But I want to read this line that Shylin has in this song, False Teachers. And I know that some will label me a Pharisee because today the only heresy is saying that there's heresy. He is preaching, excuse me, he is singing about specifically the prosperity gospel. Listen to what he says about this. This teaching can't be believed without a cost. The lie is that you can achieve a crown without the cross. It's called selfism, the fastest growing religion. They dress it up and call it Christian. Don't be deceived by this funny biz. If you come to Jesus for money, then he's not your God. Money is. I shouldn't have moved those microphones because that would have been a perfect time to just drop it on the carpet. If you come to Jesus for God, if you come to Jesus for money, he's not your God. Money is. Again, the bridge of this song, he literally lists 12 of the most well-known prosperity gospel teachers and the, just go listen to it. Again, I'm not going to read them all, even though I really want to. I'll, here, here's a low-hanging fruit, all right, because of all the crazy stuff he said about COVID-19. COVID-19, get it, Steve? All right, anyway, thank you, Steve. <laughs> oh, the bridge goes, Kenneth Copeland is it, and the backtrack goes, false teacher. <laughs> Ashley, did we learn that for the invitation today? Are you? Okay, we didn't. Really, really great song. We know the prosperity gospel is harmful. You've known that for years. They've been doing it for years. I've known that. They've been doing it my entire life. So today, again, I don't want to focus on this list of names or this, um, this author or this, this person who is filling these massive mega churches. I want to focus on how we as the body of Christ are supposed to navigate truth and how it should align to this overall arching systematic theology that we have. Our next message series, which Tim will be starting uh, next Sunday, is called this, Deception and Destruction, Postmodernism and the Spirit of Antichrist. Really, the, the idea here that we're going to look at is what it means to try to be a Christian, to try to raise Christian children, to be a Christian grandparent in a post-Christian society. And how many of you know that we live in a post-Christian society? Amen. Just so y'all know online, every hand just went up in the sanctuary. There's some really good um, points I want to draw from this passage today. Uh, you could see in my notes, as I, if I hold it up here, you can see that I have highlighted things in blue and pink. Kind of looks like a baby announcement. A sh we're not having one, don't worry. We're done. And then number five is not on the way. But the blue stuff is all the didactic things, the teaching things that we need to unpack and learn and understand together today. And the pink things are the illustrations that uh, Peter gives. Again, Peter goes off on this angry tangent, this rant. How many of you guys know that when I preach, I tend to go off on tangents? Yeah. So that's why, Jim, stop that. That was faster than your last hand raise. All right. That's why I get to preach this one this week. Follow now with me in the beginning of this text. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. But there were also fa false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. This is not a question. This is a will be statement. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. And their greed... These teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. If you're taking notes today, underneath the, the first big point, heresy is bad, I want you to write this. The dangers of heresy and false teachers. That's your first point today. The dangers of heresy and false teachers teachers. And just from these first three verses, we can see several dangers. The first one is this, it deludes the truth and it preys on the weak. And we're going to see later, it preys on new converts. But go ahead and write that one down if you'd like to as well. Just in these very first 
three verses, we see some things about heresy that I want to point out as well. Um, follow along with me in your text. There was a class participation here. Just as there will be false teachers among you, the second half of verse 1, they will, what, how do, how, what, is it, what does your version say? How will they introduce these heresies? Secretly, secretly, in darkness, behind closed doors, in meetings where they will decide, and in, sometimes in 4-4 four, four meter with a catchy melody. Now, I want to pause um, as the person who predominantly leads worship at this church, as one of the main planners with my wife and Ashley and Pastor Tim and Ken Barker. We've had to take a really long, hard look at the amount of material that we sing that comes from churches where the pastors preach heresy. And there's a really hard question right now in the church as to whether or not we should even be singing things like Hillsong or Bethel. It's hard. Beautiful name. Uh, well, Pastor Tim's favorite song. Um, goodness, uh, Forever, the first song that Ashley Cook sang at 15, 16 years old. These songs pass a spiritual litmus test. You can look at them and say, these are true, they line up. But we, as worship leaders, would be not doing our full job if we didn't tell you that the stuff coming out of the pulpit at Bethel is heretical. We would not be doing our full job if we didn't let you know that these songs are good, but don't let this be the meat of your gospel consumption. Let this be the milk. Secretly, they introduce the destructive heresies. Who will be enticed? Verse 2, what's your first word in your translation? Many, M-A-N-Y. We should not be surprised that they're packing Mega churches with purple carpet. It's a full dollar. Anyway, all right. That they're, again, filling the Astrodome, that they're the number one New York Times best selling authors because many will follow and be deceived. And again, he says, it will bring the way of truth into disrepute. The third thing, just in the first three verses that we see, that their ultimate conclusion is condemnation. Now, Peter's going to have more to say about that toward the end of this chapter, so I don't want to park there very long. But again, if you're taking notes today, the dangers of heresy are this. They delude the truth. It's introduced secretly, destructively, in darkness and quietly, and they will entice many with their fabricated stories exploited through greed. The second point today for you is this. The warning signs of heresy and false teachers. Go ahead and write that down. The warning signs of heresy and false teachers. On whom do they pray? The unstable, the desperate, new converts to the faith. But God has no trouble separating the righteous from the unrighteous as he has throughout the ages. As he has throughout the ages. Remember that. We just talked about systematic theology. Does it line up? Does this teaching, does this truth line up with what we know is the character and nature of God? Does it line up with the things that Jesus taught, what the apostles teach in the New Testament, and what Peter and Paul and all these other writers of the New Testament are saying? In verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, Peter gives us some examples through Scripture and through uh, the Old Testament of how God is able to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. He looks at the fallen angels, the fallen angels who were cast into chains of darkness. Ugh, that doesn't sound like anything I want. Um, I think the ghost of Jacob Marley comes to mind there. Not good. But he also talks about how the angels had maybe this decision that they made, and we know that they, some of them fell like Lucifer did, wanting to be more um, than they were, to be like God. Again, that was the original sin of Adam and Eve as well. He talks about how um, God divided the righteous from the unrighteous when he flooded the world, finding only Noah and his family to be righteous. And then, of course, about Lot with Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot, who we talk about a lot, and we talk about the lots of things that Lot had happened and done to him. That's a lot of lots, all right? Lots of lots going on there. But we know that Lot was deemed righteous in a world that was completely going to hell in a handbasket. In 2020, how many of you know we're still in that world? Verse 9, after he gives those examples, Peter says this, If this is so, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Verse 10, listen to this. This is especially true. This is even more so true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and despise 
authority. They despise authority. I want to park on that one for just a minute because the authority that Peter is referring to here is biblical authority, is God's authority, is not man's authority. Again, I'm going to give you a list later, but be careful, be leery, be very weary of anyone who says, God has given me a message today for the people of God. That they are expounding or extracting some kind of prophecy from the air or from their own power or their own will and not from the divine scriptures and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Daniel, that sounds really similar. It is. That's why it's so important that we understand these truths that Peter is telling us today. Again, point two is the warning signs of heresy and false teachers. Follow along with me now, beginning in verse 10, the second half. Mine starts with the words bold and arrogant. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings, yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals. Creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, revealing in their pleasures while they feast on you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. Listen to this. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bazar, Bazar, who loved the wicked uh, wages of wickedness. He was a false prophet in that day who loved the wages of wickedness. Maybe you know the story of Balaam, but he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. God used a donkey to speak to this prophet. And this number one sin, the number one sin cited that Balaam committed was that he had and wanted other people to follow his heresy. He wanted to sell tickets to his next big motivational speech and say that it was God. They will be paid back with the harm they have done. Again, these are the warning signs of heresy and specifically false teachers. One, their motivations. Their motivations are always self-driven, not God-driven. Two, how they live. I saw another preacher preach. uh, I looked up a sermon on Monday as I'm thinking about other things I might want to say. And I didn't write down the preacher's name. I should have. He was preaching at a church in California. And I know that because I just did a quick Google search on on the church and... um, and he was preaching the same passage, and he talks about this, this um, um, animals um, born only to be caught and destroyed, creatures of instinct. And I loved what he said here. What does your dog like to do? Your dog likes to eat. Your dog likes to sleep. Your dog's thinking about that lady dog down the street. Your dog's putting that cycle on repeat. Your dog likes to fetch the ball until your arm falls off. Your dog likes to go for walks or runs. Your dog likes to exercise. Your dog likes to procreate. Your dog likes to recreate. And your dog likes to eat. Now go look at the Instagram account of your closest friends who call themselves Christians. And look at the food that they eat, the yoga sessions that they attend, the 5K time that they posted, or a picture of their procreation. And my kids are stinking cute. I get it, right? I get it. Dwight, your kids are cute. They're adorable. We've talked about this in the past, too. There can be a time where those things are good, but they're not godly. Where those things might lead us away from righteousness. We might miss the mark of God because of something that is inherently not bad, something that is good. I love food. I love to run. I run so I can eat more food. Literally, that's like my main motivation to run is caloric intake. I'm not saying, again, that these things are bad, but when the Bible refers to those people who follow these carnal desires as animals, the thing that separates us as not being animals or the thing that makes us not like dogs, but more like sheep, are being close to the shepherd. Amen? We're going to continue to see that imagery as he's going to quote later from uh, Proverbs that a dog returns to his vomit and that a pig returns to her wallowing in the mud. So the warning signs, again, the warning signs of these people is that they, um, they, sed- they seduce the unstable. Gosh, just think about, think about some of those ministries that we've already thought about in our head. Again, if you've been in church for more than two years, you can start to list some of those. 
the unstable, the desperate, the unhealthy, um, the, those who are seeking wealth, those who think if I sow this seed, if I, if I pray hard enough, if I try hard enough, then I will be healthy and wealthy because that's what God wants for me. That is not in the scriptures Zil, at all. We are called to die to ourselves every day and promise that we will suffer in this life, but that our heavenly reward, as Hannah preached last week, will be so much greater. The third point I want to make today is the judgment and punishment of heresy and false teachers. The judgment and punishment of heresy and false teachers. Here's your actual tweetable for the morning, Dwight. The heretic will be punished, but the righteous will be protected. Again, Peter gives this entire imagery, this whole list of times in history where God, um, the unrighteous were pushed away and the righteous were accepted. The unrighteous angels who followed Lucifer and wanted to be like God were pushed away, but the righteous angels were exalted and are still in the, re- in the heavenly realm. Again, we see Noah and his family. We see Lot and us as sheep will also be counted righteous if we stay close to the shepherd and if we guard his word, and if we guard the truth. Continue with me in, in verse 17, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. These people, Peter again still referring to these false teachers, these people are springs without water. Literally, the Greek here means empty wells and mist driven by a storm. Think about how a mist wavers back and forth and like, oh, this is, this is in vogue now. I'm going to preach and do this. And oh, this is in vogue now. I'm going to preach and do this. And again, we, we know that popularity is one of the characteristics that should drive us away probably from, from false teachers. But being popular in and of itself isn't evil. I've said it many times in the last two years. We'll see who's been paying attention. Um, my favorite preacher is, oh, yeah, good job, Dwight. I heard him first. Class participation. You get bonus points at the end of the day, buddy. My favorite preacher is Matt Chandler. Matt Chandler has a pretty large, successful church in Texas called the Village Church. They had multiple campuses. They're actually, they're actually now, they're splitting those campuses off. Those campuses are becoming autonomous. They're training up pastors to go out and run those campuses, and they're getting back to where they have one church, and they're giving globally more and more of their income and earnings to mission work. Now, there's a guy who's got millions of followers on Twitter, he'll probably have half a million views of his sermon just this morning and is preaching the not watered down word of God, the gospel truth, because people are thirsty for it. People are thirsty for the living water that Jesus talks about to the woman at the well. When I think about that imagery, think about that imagery. What do you have? You cannot draw from, from the well. The woman at the well says to Jesus, you don't even have a bucket. Are you greater than the people who, who put this well here? And Jesus says, if you know who would have asked, you would have asked and I would have given you living water. This living water, this salvation that Jesus refers to as can only be found in the truth of him and by his blood. Think about that picture and then look again at what Peter says about these false teachers. They are empty wells. Empty wells are two things. They are useless and they are dangerous. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just, ooh, here it is again, listen. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They entice new converts. When wolves come in a pack and they look at the sheep, who are they going to get first? The outliers, the weak ones, the small ones. Ooh, come, come over here to me. Yeah, this Jesus thing is good, but also how about this prosperity thing? Don't you want to be healthy, wealthy, and live a long time? How about all this other stuff? How about you, like, you know, mail a check to Kenneth Copeland Ministries? If you're going to mail a check to Kenneth Copeland Ministries, throw it in the fireplace. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, listen to this, they are worse off at the end than at the beginning. They are worse off at the end for at the beginning. And listen to how Peter really puts the, just drives this point home in verse 21. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. It would have been better if they never had the gospel presented to them, if they were going to accept it and then twist it and distort it to be something that was about them. That is a powerful statement. 
Peter literally says it would have been better for them to never have known the gospel if they were going to take it, twist it, and distort it, because in doing so, they delude the truth of God's word. Of them, of these false teachers, the Proverbs are true. I said I was going to read this, verse 22, as Peter refers again to the Proverbs. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed, that's a pig, a pig returns to her wallowing in the mud. Think about all the imagery, all the beautiful illustrations that we use when we think about salvation. Again, accepting the living water, having the the lifeblood of Christ in you as someone who is called by the Holy Spirit, saved by the power of Jesus, and by his atoning work on the cross, and washed to be cleansed and look and made whiter than snow, which is why we baptize with water, as Tim and I have both said from this very platform. It is an image of an, an outward expression of an inward change that we are Buried, sin is washed, and we are merged, resurrected to walk anew just as Jesus was resurrected. Amen? Washed whiter than snow so that we can then go back and jump right back in the mud pit of sin and call it Christianity. Gross. I've done a couple tough mutters. Um, I've done one tough mutter. And I, I was going to do a Spartan race with Vincent. Lopez a couple years ago, and I hurt my shoulder, and I didn't do the mud. I ran around the mud. I'm not doing the mud pit. It's disgusting, right? There's no amount of like, so you get to the end of the race, and the last thing you do, sometimes they put it at the first thing. That's just mean. There's like this barbed wire, and you have to go through the mud. I'm not doing it. That's gross. That's absolutely disgusting. At the end, your shoes are so filthy that they just make this pile of shoes that they end up taking and washing all the shoes and they donate them to homeless people. Well, that's pretty cool. How about I put clean shoes in the pile because I'm not jumping in the mud. Liz made fun of me because I wouldn't jump in the mud. I didn't jump in the mud. It was gross. I was dirty enough already just from running the course. But I will say this. There are people daily continuing to jump back in the mud after they have been washed whiter than snow, and follow these false teachers. But Daniel, he uses the Bible when he preaches. Pump. Those are the brakes. Everybody do this. Ready? Pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. There is a big difference. You already tweeted, didn't you? All right, cool. All right, well, this is a good one, too. There's a big difference between quoting Scripture in your message and your message being scriptural. There is a Huge difference between quoting scripture in your message and your message being scriptural. When we preach from this platform, when we preach from Goodlettsville, we preach a style that is called exegetical preaching. That means we take the context of what the Bible is telling us, we, we think about the audience and, what, and whom it was presented to, the type of writing that it is, we look at the grammar, the wording, the definitions, we study the lexicon, which is the original definitions in the Greek or the Hebrew, And we have to look at it in light of the big picture. And Peter gives no application here in chapter 2. He just literally says, this is bad. Avoid it. This is how you spot it. So then what do we do? The thing that I want to really answer for you in our, our last few minutes together here, what then can we do? Three words, ready? I gave you heresy is bad earlier. You got three more words. Line it up. I'm not talking about me and Dwight's haircut either. I got one yesterday. Line it up. Does this line up with the truth of God's word? Does this line up with the character and nature of God? Does this line up with the teachings of Christ and with the entire systematic theology of the word? And can I take it to the read of truth, God's word, and it be completely and entirely true? And if that answer is no, then there's heresy in it. Line it up. You and I are not David. The story of David and Goliath isn't supposed to apply to our lives. Now go out there and slay your giants. That is an overreach of allegory. What an overreach of allegory does is it says that I can interpret what this Bible story means. I will tell you because in the office of the prophet, oh, just cringe when you hear those things because that's not scripturally true. The story of David can teach us many things about the good nature, the good, uh, nature of God, God's provision and God's plan, and what that can mean also for our lives. But you are not David, and you're not going out and slaying the giant of cancer with a sling and a stone. 
But it can show us that God and his foreknowledge and his love for us has ways for us to be protected as his people. We can learn a lot from the good attributes of David. We can learn a lot more from the stuff he did wrong, okay? And from the generational effect that that had on his family. You are not David. You are not Daniel. I am not Daniel. I am Daniel, but I'm not petting lions, okay? The story is not about how we can get through the lion's den. That story is about the attributes and the nature of God and what that says for his people living in Babylon. Is everybody tracking with that? Does that make sense? Thanks, Angie. Context, audience, in light of the big picture. This is called systematic theology. Application sides, I want to be, be careful list. Be careful today, church, when people use scripture out of context. We got to talk about this uh, the last time I was in the pulpit with the book of Philippians, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's not about throwing a winning touchdown. Not about kicking a field goal or doing anything else or making it rain from the outside. I made that one. It's not about any of those things. Philippians 4.13 is about contentment and about peace and joy and the fruit of the Spirit and what can rob you of your contentment. Be careful when you hear people use Scripture out of context. Be careful when anyone says that a revelation has come to them outside of Scripture. Again, this is prevalent at churches in our town, in our city, and all across, all across the web. Be careful of improper exegesis. Be careful of preaching assumption into allegory. These people will pick and choose truth. This is what the Bible means by this. Be careful. Be careful. If that's not an unpacking from someone like Matt Chandler or hopefully myself or, or Francis Chan, if that's not an unpacking that reveals something about the nature of God, the person of Jesus, or how it applies for us as Christians, then that's coming from outside the canon of Scripture. Be careful of those who overassume allegory and who tell you what stories mean. Somehow attesting that they are like Joseph. So what, Daniel? What should we then do? Look out for false teachings. Look out for false teachers. Be weary of them. A couple more names I want to give you today because there is great content online that you can sift through and watch. One of them is um, Justin Peters. Bradley, did you check out Justin Peters yet? Justin Peters has uh, cerebral palsy, and uh, he uses a wheelchair. Uh, sometimes he'll, he'll use uh, walking canes. Justin Peters, I would recommend his YouTube page. He makes several appearances in the uh, documentary American Gospel. American Gospel is available on YouTube and also on Netflix. And if you've not yet seen American Gospel, uh, my home group's not meeting tonight. Is your home group meeting tonight, Angie? Hey, watch it tonight. It is powerfully fantastic and a very, very good um, illustration and depiction of what we're talking about today. So then what do we do? We line it up. We again look at God-driven teaching powered by the Holy Spirit, pointing everyone back to the vine, to the vineyard, to the shepherd, Jesus Christ, and to his Father. I want you to write this down. The gospel always illuminates darkness. The gospel always illuminates darkness. If heresy is bad, then the gospel is good. I'm just kidding. That's not the final point. But that's it. That's it. Heresy is bad, then the gospel is good. Costi Hinn, C-O-S-T-I, Costi Hinn, nephew of, I didn't call him out, you did, Jim. All right, nephew of Benny Hinn is in this documentary, and he says, when the gospel, the true gospel, the truth of the scriptures was presented to me in a way that I understood it was convicted by the Holy Spirit, I was able to see the darkness of my uncle's ministry. The false, the charlatan healing ministry of Benny Hinn. He's been doing it for years. Justin Peters will point out, just as other teachers, go back and watch some of those from the 90s. And, and you will see, they didn't have all the camera angles figured out yet, and you will see several shots of a first and second row full of people in wheelchairs and people with crutches like Justin Peters who never make it to the platform because Benny Hinn is a heretic. He's a false teacher, and he has never healed anyone of leprosy, sickness, cancer, or anything else that they've claimed. Daniel, calm down. Peter's mad, y'all. We should be too. People being led astray. What can we do? We, church, 
need to rise up and raise some sheep dogs. Right? Everybody say amen. We need to rise up and raise some sheep dogs, some people who can circle the wolves when they go after those who are um, poor, who go after those who are sick, who go after those who are new converts. We need to rally around the shepherd and support our pastors, our teachers, and the word of God. And we need to stay close to the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, every day. And that's what Peter says, goes on, as Hannah did last week, that's what Peter goes on to say in chapter 3, that the number one way that we can ascribe to the truth is by being in God's word. Our knowledge of God through his word is the first line of defense against the conflicts and the heresies that will threaten to tear the church apart. Chuck Swindoll says this in his summary, and as Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, be on your guard. Guard dogs, I like that idea. Be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, but grow in the grace of knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Instead of being like a dog who returns to his vomit, be the kind of dog who is helping shepherd the flock. Be those who are going out and doing the work of evangelism. If you haven't already seen it again, I really encourage you to go back and watch the journey through scripture because the number one heresy, you know what the number one heresy was in AD 65, Samisha? They said, and Jesus hadn't come back yet, he probably isn't coming. AD 65? Hmm, an impatient brood. My wife hates my Yoda impression. I think most of you know that. But I did it in Goodlettsville, and I saw the look that she gave me there. And it didn't deter me from doing it again in Gallatin. It just didn't. I heard, I could hear Stephanie mock slap on top of that, Sharon. That was awesome. Like, oh, thank you. It didn't deter me. She hates it. 65 AD. And they're like, man, if he hadn't come back yet, he probably isn't coming. What? What? Okay. All right. Peter goes on to tell us in chapter 3 that God is not late. Jesus does not tarry his coming because of our timing but it is on God's timing. And he also goes on to say that if he is patiently waiting, it's so that we might be bringing more people into the fold of Christianity, true Christianity, into the flock, more sheep who are being loved and led by the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is three-pronged. There's a three-pronged approach to evangelism in the gospel. And this is always gonna be my final point. If you get tired of hearing it after two years, we're almost two years old, by the way, Gallatin. You're crushing it. If you get tired of hearing this, point three, point five, whenever I make it, evangelism is the, is the only thing that will shed the light of the gospel on this darkness. Three-pronged approach to evangelism, that God moves on the hearts and minds of men and women, that the Holy Spirit saves them by the power of Jesus Christ and through his blood, and that we are working and doing the good deeds of evangelism in our actions, our attributes, and in the attitudes of our heart. Three A's for free right there. I didn't even have those written down. There's your three A's. Our actions, our attributes, and our attitudes of the heart. Be careful today, church, of false teachings and false teachers. They're dangerous. You can see the warning signs, and their judgment and punishment is the Lord's. Fun story. You guys have time for a fun story before we watch this video together? I got a letter in the mail from Facebook. Let that sink in. <laughs> and that, I think that is hilarious, Ted. Let that sink in. Uh, the, uh, the, their address is One Hacker Way, H-A-C-K-E-R, One Hacker Way, Menlo Park, California. Mark Zuckerberg mailed me a letter. It's just the irony is not lost on anyone in this room, I know, but that's crazy. You know why Mark Zuckerberg mailed me a letter, Dwight? Because of you. I tried to boost the video with Chris and Dwight, and Facebook reviewed it and flagged it for being political and making a social statement. Now, listen to this. Yeah, right? Not only did they flag it, they locked me out of my account for 12 hours while a review was pending. I still can't boost it from Goodlesville, and I'm not sure why. But they sent me a list, five, five things to do, right? I like to call it hoops to jump through. Five hoops to jump through so I could get Dwight and Chris's video boosted. You know what I did? Stretchy pants, thank goodness. I was like, I will jump through every hoop you send me, Mark Zuckerberg. Let's go, bro. 
I got my running shoes on, and I jumped through every single hoop. I took a picture of the front and back of my license. There goes my identity. I mean, who knows where that is being sold, right? I took a picture of the, this is all for you, Mr. 13K. I took a picture of the front and back of my license. I filled out this ridiculous questionnaire. I sent them my home address. They sent me a letter in the mail. Gosh, I wish I had the letter. It's on the junk counter. Everybody's got a junk counter. Don't judge me. A letter in the mail with a six-digit to- code to confirm my identity. That video has 13,000 views, 7,000 are organically shared, and only 7 minus 13, 6. Only 6,000 of them are from Boosted, which means we as the people of God have spread the truth with the share button more than Facebook because they don't want the truth in your ads on your newsfeed. I guarantee you if that had supported some leftist off crazy, and I'm not saying left versus right right now as far as Democrat and Republican. If that had supported the, the narrative of, of the society today, if this video had supported the narrative of society today, it would not have been flagged. You know that is true, and I do too. Whether it's the hashtag I used, the world needs Jesus, or the hashtag racism that made them flag that, I do not care. And I will jump through every hoop to get this story out there because this is the kind of content that can combat the lies of people like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland. 13,000 views. It has over 100 shares. And I'm going to be really honest with you, 60 of those names who have shared the video, I've never even met the people. More than 50 or 60% of the people who have shared this video, I've never met them. Maybe they're connected to Officer Sanford. Maybe they're um, connected to Dwight and Samisha because they're related to half a Gallatin. But I don't know the people. But they are sharing this because the world is thirsty for truth. Amen? And we have it. We don't make funny sharing videos with the cooks. And they are hilarious and terrible. The bloopers are the best. We don't make terrible sharing videos uh, in the cook's basement in front of green screens because it's not important. We make it because this is the gospel, the truth that can save the souls and the hearts of every man, woman, and child. Amen? There's a lot of crap out there, and we got to be the kind of church that continues to put out good gospel-centered content. And I know there's other churches who do the same thing and are doing the same thing. First Baptist Hendersonville this week just launched their online church platform, and I said, ha, beat them. I'm just kidding. It's not a race. It is a race. We're winning. Anyway. They're going to put out great content. I know that. I know their pastors. I know the teaching that's going to be out there. And good for them. They can reach so many more people because they have more members than we do. But that doesn't mean that what we're doing is any less valuable or important. Think about your household. Think about your kids. Think about your grandkids. Think about the truth that will govern their lives. Do we want that to be what Facebook wants to throw in the ads or what we want to throw in the ads? How do we combat darkness with the light? As we watch together today, and as you watch online, in case you haven't seen it before, this video with Dwight and Chris, we don't think that this is the answer to end racism, but we do know that this is a powerful reminder of what can happen when we put aside our differences and when the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love we're supposed to show one another becomes chief and most important thing in our lives and in our hearts. Please watch. Hey, this is Pastor Daniel hey, with the Good Little Phil and Gallatin Church. Good Phil and Gallatin right Church. now, I want to challenge you to stop what you're doing, press this pause button in the corner, and pray. The video that you're about to watch, we've been talking about it for a few weeks now. You may have seen some social media posts uh, from me personally or from the church pages letting you know that something was coming, and we were very excited about it. We don't think that this video is the answer uh, to end racism in America. As we're talking about now in our current message series, we know that that only can happen through the saving work of Jesus Christ. The world needs Jesus. But the world also needs to hear stories like the one you're about to watch. Dwight and Chris come from very different backgrounds. They don't look the same. But God ordained a meeting to happen between these two men. And from that, we truly believe that people can come to know the character and nature of God and again meet Jesus because of the story of these two men. So where you are, pause right now, pray that God would use these men's story to align your heart again with the truth of Scripture and also that more people might come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ just because of this testimony. A testimony is your story, my story, and you're about to watch and hear a very powerful story from Chris and Dwight. Thanks for watching. 
it was the morning of December. It was mid-December, and I got up early to be at work around uh, seven o'clock in the morning. I got in my truck, started driving to work as I usually would, and I hit a patch of ice and lost control of my vehicle and went into a tree line. Well, uh, the tree line crushed my truck, crushing the front end over my uh, leg, which actually snapped my thigh bone. Um, as I was sitting there, people, uh, you know, EMT was there. Uh, a, lo a lot of people was on the scene, firefighters were there, and they were all trying to rescue me. But the next morning, I only remember one person. Uh, my name is uh, Deputy Chris Sanford with the Sumner County Sheriff's Office. On the night of uh, December 16, 2019, I reported for duty about 11 o'clock. And I was going down to a little restaurant. I was thinking, yep, it's been a long night. I'm going to get a hot cocoa and sit and relax for a minute. Um, and uh, just as I was thinking that, I heard the call come on the radio that there was a vehicle accident with injuries. And a man was trapped in a vehicle. So I immediately switched on my lights and sirens and uh, punched it. And so when I got there, there was um, a lot of EMTs, firefighters. And off in the distance, you could see a truck. Uh, it was kind of leaned over. Uh, it pretty much T-boned a tree, and I remember seeing this man uh, in the in the truck. He was trapped in there. The steering column and everything were had his legs pinned, and the truck was mangled. And uh, there was a portion of the roof just to the right of the man that had caved in, and that's because uh, he rolled the vehicle actually. And when it stopped, it stopped on its side, and um, about a foot to the right or to the left on impact, he would have been dead on impact, but he was very, very fortunate. Uh, I just remember that the whole experience, uh, before he got on the scene, I was terrified in a lot of pain, but the moment he got there, I was at ease. Um, I didn't know how everything was gonna end up, but I, at that moment, I felt like everything was gonna be all right. Uh, he got in the truck with me. He sat with me the whole ordeal. Uh, the first thing he noticed is that I was cold. It was cold that morning. And he took the coat off his own back and gave it to me. We were there so long, I could start seeing the cold was affecting him. And I offered him his coat back. He refused it. As they were cutting me out of the truck, uh, glass was flying and uh, shards of glass was uh, getting in my face. So he covered me with his own body. And the glass shards was hitting him instead of me. Uh, later, he told me that the next morning he woke up with those uh, same glass shards. He found pieces still in them. Uh, he really uh, sacrificed himself and his time to make sure that I was at ease and I was in comfort. His left leg was crushed and uh, there was concern that he had a, a, a bone broken internally and that he was bleeding internally and that's always a problem. So uh, the guys there made a good decision to try to get him out. They were starting to uh, what we call extract. And that means you take a, a Jaws of Life, which is a big pair of electronic scissors basically, and you start cutting the frame. And as they were starting to cut the frame, the pressure that was on the, the gentleman's legs came off. And then he started to scream because it wasn't just pressure anymore. He could feel, he could feel the intense pain. It's like Dwight, you know, it's no easy way to get you out of here. Uh, we're gonna have to just pull you out. But he said something I'll never forget. He said, I'm gonna hold your hand. He said, on the count of three, we're both gonna scream. <laughs> and that's what we did. I stayed with him, we got him to the ambulance, they got him all taken care of, and they got him to the to the hospital. You know, I told my lieutenant a couple days later, we were talking about it, and I told him, I said, sir, I, I felt compassion for that man. I didn't see skin color. I saw a man. I saw a child of God just like me. That's somebody's husband. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's daddy. That's my brother. I've thought a lot about Dwight since then, and I believe with all my heart that the Lord brought us together that morning because I was supposed to be on my way home. But I took an oath to help, and I did it. And I'm not a hero. I'm not. I just did what I promised the citizens of this great place in this great county, in this great state that I would do. And I helped my fellow man. And Dwight's my brother. And I love him. The, the biggest thing about that is, and I, and I said I call him my angel because he shared with me that he was actually off uh, duty at the time. 
and he was on his way home to get something to eat and he heard the call and he made a decision to come off the clock. So, you know, to me, uh, that was just a confirmation that it had to be God that uh, we wouldn't put together by circumstance or chance. He made a decision to come and be there. And because he did, I feel like um, that I survived that incident. I wondered about the man. So I stopped by the the KFC where he worked and I came back another time and this was in February, I think. And he was actually there. Uh, we, we talked, we, we embraced and it, it's, it's been a fun friendship. It's almost like a, he's just been a, a friend forever. Every time we get together, we joke, we have fun, we talk. Our families have gotten together. The friendship and the kinship that's come as a result of two men coming together in what was at the first a very tragic situation that's turned out to be a total blessing. It's funny how one experience, one experience can not only just alter your life, but connect two different families together. Because to be honest with you, you talk about my family, his family, I think we're one. We met so well, we love each other, and, <laughs> and we have such a good time. You know, that's my brother, <laughs> so that's how I feel. I learned a lot of things. God's provision for one, throughout the whole wreck and aftermath, you know, my family was taken care of. I love. I learned that uh, he certainly puts angels around you. And when I say angels, I mean certain people around you um, to know that you love, to know that you care for, because on that day, Chris came and it, just that after that, he's been in my life ever since. And then my church family stepped up in a real big way. So I've learned so much. So when I pass this site, you know, I just uh, uh, say thank you, God, because I learned so much from it. Hey, thanks again for watching online today with Gallatin. Church. I almost can't believe it, but just in a few short weeks, we're going to be celebrating two years since the launch of Gallatin on August 12th of 2018. Hey, maybe you've never visited us in person before. Maybe you're looking for a new church home. Maybe you're new to the area. We meet every Sunday, 1030 at 1570 Pilot View in Gallatin, Tennessee. Again, invite a friend, come and join us here, experience worship with us at Gallatin Church. And thank you again for watching online today. If you made a decision to follow Christ, please reach out and let us know. Again, if you'd like for anyone to pray with you or follow up, we can do that. GallatinChurch.Church or on Facebook, just search Gallatin Church. Thanks again. Have a wonderful week.